Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. This week, I'll be honest, I'm just sick of it. I'm sick and tired of the endless slog that the tech news beat has become with the shortages and the scalpers and the infighting and the fact that they still haven't come up with a better solution for front panel connectors. Come on, guys. So this week, I'm saying no more. I'm setting all that bitterness and negativity aside and I'm gonna focus on some good fucking news for a change, like progress with right to repair, new options on the market for PC builders, cool stuff that Intel is doing with USB-C and news of dropping VRAM prices. And you know what, I'm gonna have a beer too. Got a little aggressive at the end there. <laughs> I'm just happy, I'm just happy. Right. See, this video is basically perfect now. Cheers. And thanks for joining me today for some good fucking news. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by Micro Center, one of my favorite places to buy PC parts, whether it's online or at one of their 25 retail stores in the US. They have consistently competitive prices and an excellent selection of PC hardware and other tech goodies, as well as the custom PC builder on the Micro Center website. Use it to spec out your rig and it will show you parts in stock at your nearest store while ensuring compatibility with your selections. Then you can pick up or have their pros assemble it for you. So click the sponsor link in the description and don't forget to sign up for the free in-store gift. Another sip before we get started. My first story today, and, and, and no, GPUs are not magically back in stock at MSRP. I said this is a good news show, not an orgasmic fever dream show, but, well, actually, hold on, and maybe grab a change of pants, because GPUs kind of are back in stock at MSRP. iGPUs, that is, specifically the ones in the 5600G and 5700G that AMD is now allowing us plebeians to purchase without having to buy a whole PC from a system integrator. That means that you can get better than NVIDIA GT 1030 graphics power, which isn't saying much, but it's a whole lot better than nothing, starting at 260 bucks for the 5600G, over the counter, in the metaphorical sense, from quite a few online retailers that still have stock even a few days after launch. It even comes with a six core, 12 thread CPU attached, which is quite convenient. The great news here is that stock remains, despite the CPU reportedly selling well at launch. German online retailer Mind Factory publicizes their sales numbers and they moved 820 5700Gs on launch day versus only 610 5800Xs. Likewise, they sold 900 5600Gs versus 600 580 5600Xs. It's a limited sample size here, but not many retailers publish their sales volume with this level of detail. In normal times, an APU launch such as this would be mildly interesting, but it seems particularly special given the circumstances as there are so few alternatives right now for the DIY builder. The 5700G is also up for sale, although unfortunately the price has jumped by $10 with Amazon being the first to bump from 360 to 370 and Newegg has followed suit as of Friday morning at least. For the 5600G, definitely buy it Newegg right now. They have it in stock for 260. Don't buy it from Amazon. They're already selling it through a third party seller for 310. Beyond this though, you can also buy directly from AMD or through other online retailers like B&H, but I do have a few links for these down in the video's description. The 5700G though is an eight core 16 thread chip with eight Vega graphics compute units versus the 5600G's seven for slightly better gaming performance. And as mentioned, links to those as well as my build videos from this past week featuring them are in the description below. Now sure, iGPU gaming performance is a far cry from even lower end GPUs, but I'd still say this is pretty damn good news. Continuing today's theme, Overclock 3D reports that graphics card DRAM prices are predicted to go down in Q3 2021, according to TrendForce. GDDR5 and GDDR6 memory prices are notoriously volatile, so it's somewhat fitting that this analysis points towards the also notoriously volatile cryptocurrency market as a driving force behind the shift. Crypto prices, the article notes, have been on the decline lately, which drives down GPU demand even though things are still relatively steady on the consumer side. But hold on, Paul, you might say, I've got my ear to the ground and crypto has actually been on a, a bit of a tear, a bit of a bull run since mid-July with Bitcoin going from below $30,000 all the way up to as high as $43,000 on Friday. And Ethereum is in a similar spot, climbing from a low of $1,700 or so up to uh, close to $2,900. Actually, it broke $2,900 as of Friday. So what gives here? Uh, well, it's complicated, but it could just be that TrendForce is looking at things from a broader perspective, or it could be that Ethereum has reached a, a certain age where 
changes start to happen. The voice cracks, you start to notice girls in your classroom, and the next thing you know, you're desperately trying to explain to the teacher why you were hiding in the AV closet demonstrating your proof of work. We've all been there, but Ethereum did successfully roll out the London hard fork on Wednesday, which changed how transaction fees, aka gas fees, are handled, essentially making it cheaper to perform a transaction on the network while also burning a portion of the associated fee, which removes Ethereum from the network. And as we all know, less supply of something will usually raise the price. This change is good for the holders who have Ethereum, but means less profit via gas fees for miners. So it's a weird situation where Ethereum has become more appealing as a currency and the price has gone up, but that doesn't necessarily add up to good news for GPU mining. Hopefully the GDDR5 and GDDR6 price predictions will be realized though, because that would be even more good news for you and me. My next story is even better news. Lewis Rossman must be giddy as hell because on Wednesday, the United States FTC unanimously agreed to enforce right to repair laws, committing to enforce both federal antitrust laws and consumer warranties affected by the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. I think I can safely assume that my viewers who are into building their own PCs also support right to repair. And indeed this movement has spawned bipartisan support, long thought to be extinct in the United States, but for good reason. We can all agree that big tech companies should not be able to tell us what to do with our stuff after the stuff is bought and paid for, whether it's a John Deere tractor or the latest iPhone. Independent repair shops should not be blocked by convoluted DRM schemes, and they should have access to diagnostic tools to perform repairs without being forced to participate in some draconian authorized service program. Complex and difficult to recycle electronics should not be relegated to the landfill just because Apple doesn't want their slightly older devices on the secondary market competing with their nearly identical fancy new version of the device that they just did a big launch event for. But hold on guys, John Deere released the statement. They disagree and they say that they're against the right to repair for safety reasons to protect us and keep ourselves from hurting ourselves. Isn't that thoughtful of them? Well, thanks John Deere, but the FTC says you can stop holding our hand for now. And they'll also be doing that weird thing that should be done if laws are going to have any impact, enforcing them. Speaking of laws, quite a few people have said that there should be a law against Noctua's beige and reddish brown color scheme, which has forced many a DIY builder to choose between optimal fan functionality and minimal fan aesthetics. Nothing matches with these fans either, at least for now. But Asus apparently has plans to fix that if a recent Eurasian Economic Commission filing is accurate. News of this Asus Noctua collaboration first surfaced at the end of July via hwcooling.net, and neither Asus or Noctua have denied the rumors, but the EEC filing seems to indicate an actual product is in the works with the unintelligible model name RTX 3070 8G Noctua. I commissioned a team of cryptography and foreign language experts to decipher this seemingly random series of characters, and after countless hours, we've determined that this refers to an Asus Strix RTX 3070 with 8 gigs of VRAM and a Noctua designed cooler. Now, to be clear, the pictures that you're seeing in this article are not of the new rumored card. These images are fan-made, but they clearly represent the pent-up demand from a special group of PC builders who want more beige and brown in their lives. So Asus and Noctua, if you're listening, I'm sure that you're feeling pressure to make this GPU cooler another boring, black, gamer, edgy design with rainbow vomit RGB like all the other Strix cards, but please, at least for the sake of raw meat on the LTT forums and the handful of true dedicated Noctua color scheme fans out there, make it make it brown and beige. Just just look how well that would match. Gregory M. Bryant, the executive VP and GM of Intel's client computing group, was visiting their Israel-based R&D facilities this week when he tweeted a picture that he decided to delete rather quickly. Removing something from the internet is like getting pee out of a swimming pool though, so Anand Tech was able to show what Greg decided he shouldn't have tweeted info about Thunderbolt 5, which will apparently double the bandwidth currently available over USB-C with Thunderbolt 4 from 40 gigabits per second to 80. They'll be using pulse amplitude modulation to fit in the extra bits, which the article discusses in more detail. It's linked in the description if you're interested. But as with any accidentally leaked image like this, one has to wonder if it was done intentionally to add intrigue to an otherwise bland story about an executive business trip. If it was, I guess it worked. But is it good news? Yes, it's more bandwidth, and more bandwidth is always good news. You know what's better than a bunch of good news about tech? 
Even more good news about tech delivered rapid fire straight through the access flap of my tech briefs. Nvidia seeks world domination, we all know that, but their plans to further that goal by acquiring ARM for $40 billion have apparently been foiled by those plucky Brits across the pond. Specifically, the UK's Competition and Markets Authority has prepared a report on how the merger might affect competition and national security, and while it's not yet public, it circulated amongst cabinet ministers in late July and contains worrying implications for national security. Security. Therefore, the UK is currently inclined to reject the takeover. It remains to be seen whether conditional approval can still be worked out, or if Jensen's plans have truly been thwarted. Reddit user SkiPan found a clever way to suss out more details from the latest Steam hardware survey, which groups AMD's RDNA 2-based 6000 series cards into the other category due to so few people actually using them. Just how few people has now been determined though, by sorting only Vulkan ready systems. And it's 0.11% of systems that were surveyed, at least for the 6700 XT, which is the most used of the 6000 series GPUs. And there's only a 0.34% uptake overall for all four currently available Radeon SKUs. That's a lot less than Nvidia's RTX 3000 series, which is much closer to 4% of a share. And in fact, even the rarefied GeForce RTX 3090 has 0.38% of a share, which outpaces all the Radeon RX 6000 series cards combined. I'm not sure how this is good news, but for the sake of consistency, I guess it might make the few gamers out there with RX 6000 GPUs feel just a little bit more special and unique. AMD should definitely make more GPUs though, but they might have to wait in line. TSMC's five nanometer production queue is reportedly already fully booked and orders are already pouring in for their upcoming three nanometer line as well. It's likely that Apple is the customer sucking up the most volume as TSMC is producing their A15 Bionic SoC for the iPhone 13 series on the N5P node. But if there's any good news to be found here, it's probably that the world has become increasingly aware of how reliable so many companies are on TSMC, so new fabs are slowly being planned out. I, I just wish they would hurry up. With Radeon GPUs being so rare though, and TSMC capacity so limited, it seems a strange time to hear of this new product, the Radeon Pro W6800X Duo, which fits two RDNA 2 based RX 6800 GPUs onto the same PCB for a total of 7,680 stream processors on one card. There's also 64 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory total, 32 gigabytes per GPU, and a custom slot design meant to work with Apple's MPX module to provide 500 watts of power and Thunderbolt 3 connectivity. That's great news for independently wealthy Mac users who can spend $16,000 or more on a system with two of these cards for four GPUs total, yes, on a system better suited for developing games than playing them. And I guess also very good news for AMD who can sell these cards for $5,000 each rather than using these GPUs for RX 6800 XT gaming cards that are currently only selling for between $1,000 and $1,500. Good job, AMD. In other good news, the Pentagon can see the future now thanks to AI developed by the US military. They call the tests based on this tech Global Information Dominance Experiments, or GUIDE, and it works by observing changes in raw real-time data and then applying machine learning to hint at possible trouble. Because if Rage Against the Machine taught us anything, it's that through counterintelligence, it should be possible to pinpoint potential troublemakers and neutralize them. And neutralize them. And neutralize them. <sighs> Actually, I forget exactly where that quote came from. But yeah, they say the system can give them not just hours, but days of advanced warning before an event. And they're planning to validate it at the next globally integrated exercise in spring 2022. What could go wrong? I should remember I have a beer here. Finally, some good news for me. I got a Pixel 5 back in November 2020, and I briefly showed it in a video, uh, but I never followed up with any other content on it because I was embarrassingly irresponsible about it. I had maybe a 48 hour gap after the phone arrived, but before the case that I had ordered it for it came in. And of course, I dropped it and I cracked the screen in that brief window of time. Then I didn't know what to do next, but since the cracks were mostly on the edges, I just kept using the phone as is. 
it's still that way today. It's been a good phone otherwise, it still takes great pictures, and while I still lament the lack of a headphone jack, I've been getting by okay with some Bluetooth earbuds. That said, Google got tired of the leaks about the Pixel 6 that had been rampant, and this week on Monday they just went and announced it with images and details, and I think I'm gonna get one. It will use a Tensor SoC developed in-house by Google that will be manufactured by Samsung on their five nanometer node, and it features an upgraded photo image sensor array that captures 150% more light and sports 4x optical zoom. It'll also ship with Android 12 and the Pro version has a 6.7 inch display which I think I might be into. I generally like larger phones. We'll see though. I could also just replace the screen on my Pixel 5. I don't know. No word on price but the Pixel 6 is expected to launch in October. But there you have it guys, only the goodest and the most positive tech news from the past week. I hope you enjoyed, but whether you did or not, your feedback is always welcome, so please feel free to leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the description if you're interested in further reading. You can also click the like button if you enjoyed this video. Check out my store at paulshardware.net for a selection of excellent merchandise options, including, oh yes, uh, we got some new uh, colors for the thumbscrew shirts. Check those out. And look, beer glasses and bamboo coasters and the bottle openers and the sets. They're finally, finally back in stock. We had some shipping delays, but thank you very much, John, for getting those in. And uh, if you guys have been waiting on that, feel free to have at it and place your orders. Also, subscribe to my channel if you're not already to see more videos like this one in the future. Thanks again, everyone, for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.